this is the seventh or so of these uh, this year. And uh, now the staff uh, hustles every um, time we do this to put this together. And it's, it's about an hour's work for most of us, but for her, it's much more time than that. And so if you've at all enjoyed, like tonight, the, these apples and nuts and caramel, oh my God, this is awesome. Uh, uh, this is attributable to her outstanding service. So why don't you give her a round of applause? Thank you. Now, because this is being uh, videotaped, I kind of got to stay between here and maybe a few feet up. And I'm not sure if I can really talk and stand at the same time, stand still. That's going to be kind of difficult. Uh, my talking is better when I'm more mobile, but I'm going to do the best I can. Um, you'll, you'll hold my shirt to keep me. Keep me. Um, we are, uh, the elders um, and I have been thinking a lot this past year about how we shepherd the church and the church is growing. Um, when I got on staff, when Nick came to the church in 2010, we had a roughly 320 people and now we roughly have 720 uh, people and those are just the, 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 the um, each month attendance. There's actually more people who consider High Point Church um, and those are just the, the adults. And so I'm, our estimate is that there's probably about 1,200 adults that would consider High Point to be their church home. And as the church has gotten bigger, uh, our structures in order to shepherd people need to be flexed and changed. Um, and so in the second hour, I'm going to be chatting with the elders and the deacons and small group leaders more specifically about um, a strategy that we have. And you'll hear, if you're not in that group, you'll hear about that um, probably, probably going into the uh, next year. But to, right now I want to talk about the kind of shepherding that we do brother to brother, sister to sister in our everyday fellowship with each other. I'm talking about the kind of sharing of life that happens in the corridors here, walking into this meeting, and then as you go out into your everyday life how it is that we love and care for each other. Um, so how do we really care for one another is the subject. Um, I hardly ever, uh, one of my uh, favorite practical theologians is John Piper. If I'm preaching on a subject and he's written on it, he's like my first commentary to, to read. So anyway, this is what John has to say about caring for another. He said, a shared life is a life of doing good for others and caring uh, and sharing your possessions and your and, and your heart with others uh, a shared life that's what i want to talk about today and then he says christians are people who live for others so my goal in this session is that you would have a a clearer picture of how you can become more intentional about sharing your lives especially with the people that at high point uh, church your your church um, love one another. First John 3, 11 and 14 says this, for this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Now do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. And anyone who does not love remains in death. Now, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Now, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And so we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Um, now, now, High Point is a, is a middle class church. Uh, most of us aren't scrambling uh, to pay our rent or mortgage or, and, um, and put food on the table. Uh, God has provided um, good economic opportunities for the majority of us. And so the, the primary way that we apply 
what John has written in this text is that we actually give our lives to each other so that when you are sick, even if it's just a flu, um, I know about it and, and I'm in contact. So that when you're discouraged and I see it in your face, I take a moment in the halls to, to pray for you, right? Um, when your friend when you're at, at church has had a miscarriage, you just come with her and just sit in quiet, not assuming you understand what's going on in her life or you could even really enter into it other than to just be present with her, right? It's that kind of way in which we're actually sharing our lives with each other at High Point. And because now I've been doing this congregational care uh, deal for about two years, I can tell you that that kind of care is very much needed these days. That most of us kind of feel a little bit isolated. And when we take the time to get into each other's lives with compassion and care, and when somebody is not here for three weeks and they usually sit in your section, and you actually text them to say, hey, what's, I miss you, I haven't seen you in a while, then we're displaying the, the love of Christ in our current day. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and so when it comes to this uh, kind of service, um, this is not like, like difficult. We, we don't need a special spiritual gift to love like this. Right? I, we don't need a special spiritual gift to care for each other, to look on each other. This is, we just need to kind of be available for that. You've seen this slide before. We call it the golden window. This past Sunday, uh, after I finished preaching, I walked through the aisles and I ran, I ran into a woman. She might even be here, so I'm, I'm not going to call her name. But she was expressing something that the, the elders have been talking about for a while, which is that she's been in our fellowship for about three weeks and just really having a hard time connecting. Now there's one, she's a single woman, there's one brother uh, um, in the church who's been, who, who's been uh, paying attention to her and so forth, but she's really not being able to connect much with other folks. And so one of the reasons Pastor Nick uh, talked about this golden window opportunity which is, and, and, and the other thing is this, is that right now, there's a lot more visitors coming to High Point Church. This past week, my, my son was here with his girlfriend. Uh, she's not a Christian. Uh, but she works with some High Point people. And she was like, they love this place. They love it, and one of the persons that she works with is in our membership class. And in, not only do I know him, I know another girl who works with us too. And so I just, and, and I asked her, so how did it go? And I'm like, this is, this is really good. I'm really encouraged. And, I, and we're seeing more and more of this, that people who visit High Point, that there's some momentum, there's some energy. But the, the problem with momentum and energy, if it's not connected to practical love, if we can't integrate them into our church on a, on a regular kind of systematic kind of fluid basis, we're going to lose people. They're going to stay on the fringes. They're going to drift away. And so uh, at the end, you, you folks here who come, and um, most of you are regulars. I see you every time that we, we're here. You're the people that we're counting on, along with our elders and deacons and small group leaders. You're the people we're counting on to actually execute this, to say at the end of every service, the first nine minutes, I'm going to meet some new people. Now, they may be high point people for nine years, but you've never shaken your hand. That counts. Or they may be a person that's just coming the first time. And I'm telling you, there's probably 5% of the people who come on a Sunday are in that camp. This is the first time here. And um, connect with them. And where you can, I, I invite them out to have lunch with you. Or maybe invite them at some other time. And that'll start that, that fellowship that people are looking for, that love. So we, we're, that's how we, you know, that's the best way. That's the best way we can love the stranger. Golden window. Next, I want to talk about encouraging one another. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says this, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. We encourage each other with our presence. 
um, you know one of the things that um, discourages small group leaders who host is when there, there are people that are in their small group that don't show up. Uh, so I spent five years um, as the uh, elder, as the leader of small groups ministry, and the biggest, by far, the biggest complaint I would ever get from a small group leader is, man, this person, I just can't get them to come regularly. So one of the ways that we encourage each other is we show up. We show up when we're expected to volunteer. We show up to small group meetings. We are, we're dependable. So just showing up, we show up when we know somebody's hurting or sick or discouraged. We show up because we want to be in their lives. So we want to encourage through showing up. And the other thing is uh, we, do, we want to make sure we don't withhold an encouraging word. If you see someone uh, at our church, maybe uh, one of the women who, when the service is ending, is restocking the, 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 the pew folders, what do we call those things? The, the, the things in front of the queue, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. So when they're re restocking those things, um, uh, some of those folks have been doing that for 30 or 40 years. And so to, to stop them and say, hey, you know, I really appreciate that the way you serve us. Or if you were to see Paul or one of our folks who do maintenance for the church and say, uh, I know it goes unappreciated, but you guys keep painting. I tell you, the biggest thing I see with those guys is they paint those stinking walls year after year after year. They keep having to do it, you know. It's kind of like us washing dishes all the time. You know, you just kind of get tired of it. But they keep the place looking beautiful for us, and it's a, it's a great ministry. So encourage those folks who are kind of working behind the scenes. Now, this one is particular to me. So because I'm a preacher and I got the mic, I can speak on behalf of anybody who, anybody who preaches or teaches. Now, this would be an adult Bible class or a youth teacher or a children's minister, anybody who teaches students. If you really want to encourage them, don't just say, oh, you know, I, I, really, I really liked your sermon this week. You know, that's nice. I, I, guess, I guess I would rather you say that than, Lord, that sucked. I mean, I really would rather, I guess I would rather that. But if you really want to encourage whoever's speaking, I offer you these tips. This is specifically what you said that impacted me. This is where I was hurting and where God was ministering in my life. Um, th this is how I applied it. I actually did something with it. This is I, what I did with, with what the scripture taught. And this is what's happening in my life. So if you want to encourage me, send me one of these once a year. And if there's 100 in here, 150, you'll have the happiest pastors you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> and catch this up. Do this for the, your, your children's leader. We got folks like Frank Pekovich, who he hasn't had a kid in children's ministry in 30 years, and he's been serving in that ministry faithfully. And I wonder, I wonder if Frank has ever gotten a letter from the parents of the kids he served. Um, but anyway, this is, we should be, be careful to encourage each other as we serve. And when you see somebody um, uh, being excellent or helpful, take a moment and thank them. Take a moment and encourage them. All right, at your tables right now, we're going to have a quick chat. This green sheet is the one I want, I want you to pull out, this green one. Um, it has a section called Love and Encouragement. And you will see uh, four questions that I would like you to, to, to discuss briefly. And um, so I will, give you, I will give you 10 minutes to discuss those four items at your table. Okay? Dig right on in. In this uh, area of, of those four questions, there's a, number two is a one that I wish as a church, I pray as a church that we will get better at. Uh, when is the last time you checked in on someone from High Point that you have not seen in a while? That can really change our fellowship, uh, checking in on folks who are kind of drifting away. Uh, w whether it be in the summer months when we assume folks will drift away, or we have certain friends that might, you know, in hockey season, they're going to be away more. Um, but nobody would mind if you check in on, to say hello. Uh, next thing I want to do is talk about uh, sanctify one another. This is this idea of um, helping each other be purified from our sins. I forgot what sermon it was uh, recently, but I said... Uh, you have to be willing to have the tough conversations 
and to, and to say things. And so as soon as I finished that sermon, I'm smiling. I go out in the lobby, and a young woman comes up to me. She says, you know what, Lloyd? I teach my, my kids at home not to use the Lord's word and his name in vain. And you, this, this particular sermon, you uh, a couple, three times did that. And then while, while she was talking, my uh, cell phone was going off. It was Nick with a text. And the text was like, Lord, you got to watch that. <laughs> so I was like, oh, seriously, seriously. And so I was like, you know what? Thank you so much. And so, what, and so I just did it at the beginning of, the, uh, of this session. I said something like, oh, my God. And I got to stop it. And, and as soon as I said it, I was convicted because this young mom came and told me, I'm teaching my kids not to do this. So we need to go ahead and do that. And that now she checked me, so now I'm checking myself. And what, what we need in order to do this, I'll talk about in a second. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, that is, you're not trying to set somebody right just because you want to be right. And I hate people like that. And, and you do too. So it's not, it's not, that, it's not that you want to correct them because you want to be right. You want to correct them because you want them to be holy. You want them to be godly. So you have their best interest at heart, right? Uh, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person, keyword, gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted by the same kinds of things that we don't like. And it's a funny thing. The things I hate the least in my kids are the things that are worse about me. Come on. So you might be tempted by the same kind of sin. Carry each other's burdens. Uh, come alongside and help them with that sin. That's why I think the forgiven and free class has been taken off so much. It's because the, the men and the women who come are feeling like, um, I don't have somebody coming to beat me over the head. I have somebody coming alongside me to encourage me when I'm doing well or when I slipped up and I won't find any condemnation. I'll just find a friend that's going to help me up. And so we want to come along each, uh, each other, aside each other and help uh, carry the burdens. And this way you fulfill the law of Christ, which of course is the law of love. So one of the questions, this is a self-reflective question when we take the next break, I want you to think about is who is growing in holiness because of their association with you? This is a question that gets to how good you are at discipling others. So who can you see because of their association with you in small group, in men's ministry, in women's ministry, or you're a youth leader? Which of those teen girls that you've been looking over for five years can you see maturity because they've been around you? And if we look at if we can ask ourselves that question and we, we can't come up with many, and we got to say, man, maybe I'm not just living enough self-sacrificially. Maybe I need to be more intentional about how I'm living for Christ. The next thing I want to talk about is this idea of, of being accountable. Ephesians 5 and 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is a key verse. It comes right before the instructions to the husband and to the wife. And uh, what it says is, all of us brothers and sisters in Christ are on the same level. And all of us are in a situation where we're coming alongside each other and serving. That there isn't a hierarchy. It says that we're supposed to submit to one another. That means that, that Pastor Nick needs to submit to you. And that as well as you uh, submitting to Pastor Nick's leadership. There's a mutual submission that goes on. And it's a beautiful thing when you've got leaders, especially in large organizations where you've got senior leadership that buy into this, that get that they're servants. You've got an organization that's going to go someplace, that's going to be dynamic, right? Submit to, to each other. First Peter 5 says it the same way. Check this out. He gets more specific. Peter does. He says, in the same way, he's talking about submission, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the, your orders. Now, look at the pivot he takes. No, no, he, all of you. He says, so uh, my grandparents, of course, I'm going to submit to my grandmother. But th the older person needs to recognize that they have a, a role in submission too. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Why? Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 
And so we all want to be growing in this, this uh, in humility and, and a willingness to submit and to be corrected because when it comes to being accountable, it requires two things. It requires in, in each of us a willingness to be told that there's some improvement that needs to happen in, in you. It requires that kind of humility if there's going to be any actual change in you. And then it requires courage so that even if I know I'm going up to a tough and prickly person and I see the ketchup on their face, right, S spiritually speaking, right, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to take the risk even with the prickly person and gently try to restore them so that they can grow into Christ. We need to be courageous when it comes to being accountable. All right, at your tables, I want to take, it is five after, we'll go to ten after. And what I want to do is have you talk about these two questions. I want you to think quietly about the personal reflection question. Who is growing in holiness because of their association with you? I don't want you to discuss that. I want you to take a minute and think about that. And maybe you might, yes, I want you to do that. And then the second question is, can you give an example of how you allowed someone at High Point to correct you? I do want you to talk about that. Can you give an example of how you allowed somebody at High Point to, to connect you, correct you? Go ahead and jump in on that. Here was an interesting thing that insight we got at my table. Um, at my table, we've got some folks who've been at High Point for a, a while, and they were struggling to come up with an example uh, of when somebody came up and tried to gently correct them. Now, here's one of the things about uh, Christians. Here's a false niceness that we have, is that uh, we can see people's relationships sliding, their marriages failing, their, their employment opportunities drying up, and because we're nice, we don't tell, tell them, pull their coat down and say, hey, man, maybe, maybe this might be the problem. Maybe you might want to think about it this way. So I think we need to take off false niceness, which allows me to suffer in my sin, and put on real kindness, which is to tell me about it. All right. Be at peace with one another. Ephesians 4.3 says, uh, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I came to High Point at the very end of a, a season of disunity at the church. Now, I didn't, I didn't know it. I, didn't, and the, uh, I applaud the, the leadership of the church and the average members, because when, when my wife and I moved to High Point in 2006, they were in the midst of some relatively substantial uh, challenges at the elder level, but I didn't know it. Uh, but I found out about it in about a year. In fact, right after my wife and I joined the church, uh, the, the previous pastor resigned, and it was kind of curious because he didn't have a job. So, you know, not being the wisest guy in the world, I knew something was up, right? I knew something wasn't quite right. And you, you learn stuff later on. Um, but one of the things that has been the hallmark of High Point since we got the interim Pastor Bill Lurch and carried over to when we called Pastor Nick is that there has been an extreme amount of unity at the, I'll call it the highest levels, at the elder level of church. Now, I know this because when Nick started as an elder, that's exactly the same day I started as an elder. So I've been on the elder board the whole time. And I can tell you, among the elders, we have disagreements, but we always love each other, and we always have the big picture in mind, Jesus. And we always have the love of the church in mind. And that's more important than us being right. And so we have, uh, this is what I'm most proud of, of being at High Point for the years I've been here on the Elder Board for nine years, is the unity that we have labored for and that continues to the current day and that will allow High Point to flourish for decades to come if we keep it. Unity is really important. God blesses unity. Uh, Philippians 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Now, I plead with my friends, Yodia and with Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. So, um, 
When we have disagreements and challenges, address them. Uh, one of the elders of our church kind of reached out to me on an a issue that I, to be honest with you, I wasn't even thinking about. But probably they could maybe see some seeds of disunity and they came and we had a discussion. And what tremendous courage it takes to, to see some things that may be smoke or m could be a fire and actually speak into it to bring reconciliation. We want to speak into these things before they become problematic. That would be the proactive, godly thing to do. And then when we see issues, we want to speak the graceful truth. We want to tell the truth, but we want to say it in a way that they can hear it appropriately. And then the last thing is, uh, anytime we're engaging a problem at the church, we want to keep it in mind the big picture, which is the unity of the church. Our overall unity is the most important thing. It's more important than you being right. It's more important than the problem being resolved just the way you thought it ought to be is that we resolve it and with the love of Christ um, being foremost and our relationships being intact. That's more important. Now, here's a question I have for you. This is just a reflection question. In your relationships with people at High Point Church, that's how I want you to think about this. Are you working, working more towards unity and thought and deed with your brothers or sisters in Christ or just a functional truce? Right? There's issues, there's, there's problems, there's, we know that there's some issues between two sisters and we just want it to end. You know, have you, had, you ever had people like that? They just hate to see discord and if they can just get them to just stop for a minute, right? Well, that's one way of looking at it, but that doesn't bring, that doesn't deal with the issues that are at the root. Are you actually looking to get unified in thought and deed or are you just willing to just stop fighting, just stop fighting? Sometimes, you need to have clear disagreement and spend weeks and months actually working on that disagreement to get peace is better than you uh, settling for a unsatisfactory truce, a, a false sense of peace. It just means you stopped fighting. It, it didn't mean that you resolved the issue, you just stopped trying to fix it. So let's not settle for that. Let's, when we see um, disunity and problems in our relationships, let's try to reconcile and get on the same page. That's the way of Christ. Next, I want to talk about praying for each other. Ephesians 4.18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. That might be 5.18, but it's in Ephesians. Trust me on that. It's in Ephesians. 1 <laughs> Timothy 2, 1 and 2. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. I think oftentimes uh, we complain more about our times or our politicians or our workplaces, and we spend a lot less time praying through it. Uh, God gave me a real conviction about this. When I was um, at a church in Waukegan, um, Waukegan Baptist Bible Church for about nine years. There was a, and I was a leadership in some ministry, I think it was a, I was teaching Sunday school. And there was a woman, um, she was a young woman, single mom. And I just had this, you ever had this vibe that somebody just hates you and you just can't figure out why? I, I had this vibe, and you know what? We never had a cross word, I couldn't figure it out. We never had a cross word, but I could tell she couldn't stand to be in my presence. And after a while, because she was in my class, it got to be uncomfortable. You know, I was like, eh. And so, but I didn't even know how to engage it. You know, hey, do you hate me? You know, I, had, I didn't know. I really didn't know how to hate her. So I started praying for this lady and her child for about a month. And her disposition changed to me. I never, ever talked to that woman. By the time I left that church, we were the best of friends. And I'm telling you, I never knew what the problem was, but God knew what the problem was. And I prayed on it. And so prayer changes a lot of things. It changes your marriage relationships. Your, it changes the way you think first. When I'm praying to God, the first, thing I, the first answer to prayer I get is a change of fouled mind. I'm not thinking straight. 
And in the course of the prayer, God changes how I'm thinking. And guess what? Sometimes he changes the way other people are thinking, <laughs> who you're struggling with while you pray. God is changing their hearts too. And when the saints pray for each other, when I, when I told the church that I was dealing with depression, man, I know some saints started praying for me. And I'm telling you, I'm receiving the dividends of those, those prayers right now. Every now, those, every now and then those people come and still talk to me. How you doing? I said, I'm doing great. Keep praying. I'm doing great. You must be really bombarding heaven with prayers because I'm doing wonderful. So we need to pray for each other because prayer changes the way we think. It changes circumstances. Some prayer does things that we can't do in our own efforts. Problems with your kids, pray. Problems in your marriage, pray. Problems with people at work, pray. Pray first and see what God might do. At your tables, um, prayer requests. I think it's a good thing from time to time when Nick, Mike, and I, who are the senior staff elders, right? Uh, Kent's our elder chair. Uh, the senior staff elders are Nick, Mike, and I. I think it's, it's appropriate sometimes that when we give you prayer requests and ask you to pray for us. Um, a, a, a lot of how God blesses the church is through the, the, the people who do full-time uh, pastoral ministry. That's a lot of how God blesses you is through that. And so what I have here is the prayer request. Um, Nick uh, le left town, so I asked Jill to give me what I asked her. What's your opinion on the kinds of things that Nick would pray, uh, would ask for, right? Would ask for. And then th these ones I wrote myself. Uh, Lord, may the Lord help me to continue to grow spiritually. My growing skill and influence as a parent of my adult children. My older son, Jason, I've been struggling a little bit, so he came to church with his girlfriend. We had a good two-hour meal, and, and, and uh, it wasn't a great spiritual conversation, but we were like, yeah, we're going to go catch a Bucks game pretty soon. He was like, yeah, Dad, we need to go catch a Bucks game. I, I would grow in skill and influence. I can't influence him like I used to when I could just say, hey, man, just do it. <laughs> now, now i got to say, hey, man, could, do you want to do this? <laughs> you know? I got nothing, you know? May High Point's upcoming plans to shepherd the flock be effective and continued freedom from depression. Now, uh, I asked Mike today, I said, Mike, send me some prayer requests, and he wouldn't send them. So I wrote, so I wrote these things out here. I said, please pray for Mike. Uh, most of you know Mike deals with chronic pain, especially in the back and legs and so forth. And you, some of you know that he is a, has a ministry at the state capitol where he's kind of the chaplain there. He usually goes, I think it's Wednesdays, isn't it? Is it Wednesdays that he goes? And I want to, um, since Kent and Mark spent a lot of time with Mike, and Mike wouldn't give me his prayer request, is there anything that you would, might add to the, to the, thing, to the things about, about a prayer request from him that you think he wouldn't have a problem with? Is there anything he might add? Yeah, so, so Mike's biggest prayer would be that you pray for him to have the grace to, to make it through today, right? And... and for God to give him that grace. Um, just a second, do you, can do you remember him? Annette uh, got his prayer request message, so she's going to tell you what they are. He had three prayer requests. He's had some stimulation wires put into his spine to help deal with back pain, and we're going to pray that th that is a s solution that works for him, and he's having surgery to get them put in permanently, and we're going to pray for a, a good surgery and that no infection would set in for the, um, the incision. The second prayer request is wisdom in dealing with the future and the path for ICS. And the third prayer request was that his oldest daughter would remember what Christ has been to her in her life. All right. So I'm, I'm going to give you just five minutes because i got to be done at 730. So i got to be done. I'm probably pushing it. I want to give you five minutes um, to think about those things, and we'll come back, and I'll close up five minutes. Let me call you back together. And I, and I know you guys are praying. In fact, let me enter into your prayer as we, as we close. Lord, um, I just bless you for these saints who are praying for each other, um, praying for their, their leaders, uh, praying for their brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are hospitalized because they, because they love them. We love each other. And we know that when we love each other, one of the best things we can do, maybe the most important thing we can do is pray for each other. 
So we share our lives with each other. That's what I've been talking about, share our lives with each other. Romans 12 and 10 through 13 puts it this one. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Honor one another above yourselves. That's that submission bit. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep up your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Now be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. That went to? Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? One of the things I appreciate about being at High Point is we're generous with our money. Um, couples who are going on honeymoons, I, I, I've seen folks give them their, their cabin. and uh, We have over $50,000 in our benevolence fund. Most of it goes to people that you and I don't even know. And it's just a blessing. It's a blessing. So God is saying to us that, you can go ahead and we can continue to be generous and God, we can't be God given. <laughs> and he's going to resupply when we give to the things that matter to him. So don't be worried about uh, the love of money. Let's not love, let's love each other and love God's mission more than we love our bank accounts. Hebrews 13, 14 says, for we do not have here an enduring city, but we're looking for a city that's to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that openly profess his name. And do not, the last admonition I want to give you, forget to do good and to share with others. For with the way that we love each other intimately, God is well pleased. Lord Jesus, I thank you for uh, High Point. I feel like I can see us growing in love, Lord. There's more compassion um, more willingness to deal with each other's messy situations gently and not ignore it. More growth in godliness. And we know that comes from, from you, Father, and your word and the spirit that works mightily in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.